I'm Rob Skinner, and this is the Rob Skinner Podcast. Today, I'm re-releasing one of my most listened to episodes from the Rob Skinner Podcast. Listen as I interview Sean Wooten, missionary to Eastern Europe and organizer of the Revive EE program. This episode really inspired me to fast, to pray, and to recommit to the mission. All this and more on the Rob Skinner Podcast. Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no-regrets life, make this life count, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Today on my podcast, I've got Sean Wooten from Kiev, Ukraine. Sean has been a missionary since the early 90s. He's been to Russia, he's been all over Eastern Europe, and he's still on the mission field 30 years later. It's one of the people that I respect the very most in the kingdom of God, and I'm looking forward to this interview today. Sean, thank you for joining me. Oh, amen. Thanks for inviting me. It's and so happy birthday to your wife yesterday. I think it was her birthday. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. We had a great time together. Uh, she just keeps getting better and better. I'm so so glad to be married <laughs> to her. Amen. Well, Sean, you're uh, like I, I shared at the introduction. I mean, you have been all over the world. You're still preaching the mm-hmm. word. You're making such a difference. Um, you're an American living in uh, Eastern Europe, in Kiev, Ukraine, and I'm looking forward to talking talking to you about all of this. How did how did you become a Christian? Tell me about your conversion story. Uh huh. Okay. Um, well, first of all, it is it's great to be on this call with you and. Uh, the respect and admiration and inspiration is mutual. Um, I've been following you for years. And I've always been inspired. And I think the initiative you've taken on to work with some of the smaller churches to get them multiplying um, is just an awesome focus. And we can talk about this more later, but I think the big churches have to learn how to be small churches. Um, and I just think every church at a certain level needs to see itself as a small church. Um, so I think you're doing some incredible work with that. Thank you. Also really enjoying your book. Um, the whole team for Revive is, and I can share about that too. But uh, as far as becoming a Christian, um, <clears throat> as a young kid, I had a very idealistic faith and this huge admiration for Jesus. Um, but I hated church that I was drugged to on the weekends. <laughs> and uh, I, I literally couldn't, for the life of me, figure out why we were there. Um and uh, so I, I didn't enjoy that. And I, I was a tennis player. So as I got better in tennis, um, if you make it into the finals, you play on Sunday. So I worked really hard so I wouldn't have to go to church. <laughs> what, a, what a motivation to become a good tennis player. Um, but uh, so then, you know, later, a little later on in life, as I became a teen, a lot of my friends would invite me to religious events. I, you know, I was always in training, so I didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't go to parties, didn't have time for a girlfriend. Uh, but my friends would invite me to Christian things, yet they were going out and partying on Friday and Saturday. And and I was like, this is just, you know, you guys claim to have God in your life and, and you share with me as if I don't, yet your life doesn't resemble anything in my mind of godliness. Um, and if you have God and I don't, then then God must be incredibly weak. Wow. So I just, I kind of landed on that. And my parents got a divorce when I was 16. So I just kind of had a shattered view of love and idealism and basically became an atheist. Um, and uh, when I was at the university um, playing tennis, um, I played for the University of Kansas. Um, and my summer gig was I'd work in Southampton, New York, uh, teaching the wealthiest people in the United States, their kids tennis. Um, so that was kind of my summer job to pay for my college education. Um, and although I was an atheist, uh, God started to work on me and soften my heart some because I dreamed of being rich. I dreamed of getting a job on wall street. That's why I took that job in the Hamptons. Right. And, uh, 
you know, but I, I was around these people and I, I'd never seen a less happier group of people in my entire life. And they were absolutely the most wealthy and accomplished people I'd ever met. And I just couldn't put it together in my head because I was sure if I had money, then I could make a difference. I could do something great. Mm. Money will allow me to, to, to have an impact. Right. In my heart, it just wasn't wanting to be rich. I wanted to have an impact. Right. Yet I saw these people, they, what, what to me was most important, they just, it totally escaped them. Mm. So I started to question that some and um, came back from my summer gig and I was at the university and I was at a tennis tournament and there was a guy, one of the coaches reached out to me and um, he said, hey, do you believe in God? I said, well, no, I'm, I'm an atheist. And he said, why? And I said, well, because, you know, Christianity is for people who have nothing better to do with their lives. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, so what do you believe in? I said, well, I'm an, you know, I'm electrical computer engineer. I believe in evolution. I'm basically, you know, too smart for God. That's mm -hmm. what. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he um, shared with me some apologetics, and he showed me an article that, for the life of me, I can't find it now. Um, I don't know. Maybe he made it up, <laughs> but it worked <laughs> on me. He basically said there was a story in the Bible when somebody prayed and the sun stopped for 24 hours. And I said, well, I don't believe that, you know, that's, that's ridiculous. Then he showed me some article that says that people, some scientists couldn't figure out why there's this hole in the space time continuum of 24 mm -hmm. hours. And, it, and, and I, you know, I thought, Whoa, okay, wait a minute. If, and it spooked me to be honest. And I said, you know, okay, wait a minute. If there is a God, then there's a heaven and there's a hell. And if there's a heaven and there's a hell, then I need to be really, really sure what I believe. I right. just, I cannot wing this. I have to be certain. Right. So I went home. I was unnerved. I came back the next day to the tennis tournament and I came out to, I said, you know, I think I believe in God. What do I need to do? Oh I mean, my gosh. I'm afraid. I'm afraid maybe I'm wrong. What if there is a God? And, and, you know, I was literally a little bit nervous and, and he said, well, pray with me and tell God that you love him and you'll be saved. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah, that's all you got to do. I said, are you sure? And he's like, yeah. And I said, well, wait a minute. You know, I was in a bar two nights ago and I told half the women in there that I love them, but I don't remember them the next day. I mean, mm -hmm. you're just telling me to say three words and, and all of a sudden it's all right. Right. You're, you're telling me God would stop the sun yet. I'm just going to say three words right? and it's all good. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't wrap my brain around it. And we argued for like a half an hour. And then I said, you know, thank me. I said, thank you so much for helping me to believe in you. But I don't think you have it right. I, I just don't think you, I don't think you're right. Wow. And um, I went home, stopped by Walgreens, um, bought a Bible. Um, <laughs> and I decided I've got to figure this out. There's way too much at stake here. So I went home. Um, opened the Bible, uh, started reading Matthew chapter one, you know, the father of the father of the father. <laughs> and I looked at it, I thought, I have no idea what to do. Um, so I closed the Bible and um, turned off my light and I prayed. And I said, you know, God, if you're out there, help me find you. Um, and it was like a 15 second prayer. Um, but, oh, did I, I really wanted him to hear that if that was the case, if he existed. And um, two days later, Tuesday, I was walking from an engineering building to the to the um, cafeteria. It was like minus 15 degrees out. I had on my Letterman jacket um, and my headset. And I'm an introvert by nature, so I don't like to be bothered. Right. Um, and uh, this guy stops me. And he asked me to take off my headset. I take off my headset. He says, I would like to invite you to a Bible talk. And that had never, ever in my life happened to me. I didn't know that existed. So wow. I almost felt like this is the answer to my prayer on Sunday. God sent somebody. To right, me. right. And I was like, wow, Bible talk. So what's going to be there? And he said, you know, this and that. And I was a little skeptical, but, you know, he said there'd be food there too. So between the fact that I prayed and I was hungry, um, I agreed. Hmm. And I came to Bible talk and uh, it absolutely blew me away. I mean, I, I couldn't believe the Bible was so alive and could answer real questions. Wow. Like I could never understand why my parents got a divorce. I could never understand why me and my girlfriend fight all the time. I could never understand that emptiness. I could, I kept going after either professional tennis or a career or a job or wall street. And anytime I'd get success, it still felt empty. 
And that Bible talk, it was a Bible talk on building on the rock or the sand. Wow. And it just like scales fell from my eye. And the brother, Damon Paps, who led the Bible talk, he was so vulnerable. And he said, you know, immorality and, and pornography and this and that. And I can't believe he was saying these things. Right. <laughs> and he said, sex outside of marriage is a sin. It's, it's hurtful. It's harmful. It's not. And I had a girlfriend at the time. So, you know, after the Bible talk, I went up to her. I said, look, I disagree with you about the whole immorality thing. I don't think it's a sin. And he said, well, what do you mean it's not a sin? I said, well, I love my girlfriend. I don't know why we can't be together. There's people who get married because somebody's rich or because someone's beautiful. They don't love each other. They're just using each other. Yet you say it's okay for them just because they have a piece of paper. I don't have a piece of paper, but I have real love. Right. And he said, okay, you really love her. And I said, absolutely. He said, do you want to marry her? I said, absolutely. And he said, okay, what's a plane ticket cost to, she was in New York. He said, what's a plane ticket cost to New York? I said, about 400 bucks. He said, I'll write you a check right now. And you can fly tomorrow to New York and you can propose to her and you can get married. And I was like, dude, wait a minute. I'm not ready to get married. And he's like, well, what do you mean you're not ready? You, you, you just said you're ready. If you're ready, do it. Um, and I was like, well, I'm not exactly sure. And he said, well, look, if you had a daughter one day that a guy was going to sleep with her that, did, that didn't necessarily want to particularly be with her, would you approve of that? And I said, I'd kill him. <laughs> he, said, he said, well, look in the mirror. He said, don't you see that that's who you are? And I was wow. like, oh, my gosh. Wow. And I was like, will you study the Bible with me? And he was like, sure. And I said, how much does that cost? And he said, it's free. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Because it's like not the best day of my life. <laughs> so started studying the Bible. And uh, it took about two months um, because I had a lot of doubts and a lot of questions, but mostly just to masquerade my desire to keep sinning. Um, but God just really opened himself up to me. And I absolutely um, just fell in love with who God was. And, and it answered all the questions for my existence and everything. So I was so encouraged. I remember after the discipleship study, Mark Templer studied the Bible with me and Damon Pabst. And I came back after the, uh, came back after the discipleship study and Mark said, so how are you feeling about the study? I said, oh my gosh, it's incredible. The world could be changed. This is amazing. And he said, that's great. And I said, I said, I've decided, you know, cause I got the job on wall street. I got a job offer on wall street. And I said, um, I want to quit my job on Wall Street and I want to go in the ministry. And he's like, I, we didn't mention that in the discipleship. <laughs> I didn't bring that up. As a he said, where's that coming from? And I said, I said, do you have any idea? In, in one hour, you explained to me something that although I've been around Christianity my whole life, no one's ever explained that to me. I've never understood how simple it is to be right with God and what God's dream is for our lives. Mm. I said, if, if I could do what you did with me for the rest of my life with as many people as possible, that's what I want to do with my life. That's, that's my dream to change the world. Getting rich isn't, isn't the thing that can do it. It's this. It's what you just did with me. That's what I want to do. Right. So I was, I was sold wow. after that. I just wanted, I wanted to spend my whole life telling that that to other people that's so awesome that's kind of the conversion story and so you got baptized shortly after that yeah i got baptized january 10th 1991 so i i came to church like a week before thanksgiving i came home for thanksgiving actually cleaned up after myself it almost put my mom in shock she had no idea what happened to me <laughs> <laughs> immediate household <laughs> repentance that's great yeah, and well i reached out to my girlfriend and we broke uh, you know we kind of decided to do things right. Um, she became a Christian two weeks later. Oh, awesome. Uh, my roommate persecuted me. He became a Christian two weeks later. Maurice Hooks, football team, studied the Bible, became a Christian. Um, so altogether, 14 of my friends and classmates, the first four months I was a Christian, became Christians. Oh, my God. 14 um, people? Yeah, from the university and relatives. And my younger brother became a Christian. Um it was a crazy time. It was, I didn't really do any of the studies. I had the other, you know, Damon and the other brothers were helping me study because I felt like I'd make a mistake and ruin their salvation forever. <laughs> but eventually after being in all those studies, I started to get the hang of it. But now that's amazing. So, okay, let me just back up here a little bit. So you, are you from New York or are you from Kansas? 
No, I'm from Kansas. I grew up in Overland Park, Kansas. Okay, what's your connection to New York? Why are we going there to, to teach tennis? Uh huh. So my dream um, was to work on Wall Street. Um, and, uh, you know, I was a tennis player. And during the summer, um, you know, I, I would, I, a friend of mine landed this job in the Hamptons. And uh, from that, he got invited to work for one of the, you know, one of the big banks, investment banking in New York on wall street. So I told him, dude, if there's ever an opening in, in one of these clubs, could you please get me a job so I could get up there and meet the people that could get me onto wall street? My, my end I game see. was wall street. I see. So it was, it was really like a networking opportunity for you to right. make connections. Right. That's great. That's smart. Wow. So you so, beca- go ahead. No. Yeah. So that's how I got to New York. Uh huh. So the first four years I was a non-Christian in New York. Then the last year I went back there that summer as a Christian. And um, so that was an interesting story, but I ended up getting fired. Um, A little too zealous. Well, and because, you know, when I, the biggest day for making money is Sunday, right? Because all the people take their helicopters out there to their homes in the Hamptons and they want to play on Saturday and Sunday. So to get Sunday off is an impossibility. Got it. Um, So when I was studying the Bible, actually, um, when we were counting the cost, you know, the question came up, how do you feel about coming to church? And I said, I wouldn't miss church over my dead body. And then he's like, well, how about summer, you know, with your work? And I said, oh, we'll all have to miss during the summer just because, you know, Sunday's the biggest day. I, I can make 800 bucks in a day. I mean, it's, it's, it's how I pay for my college. He's like, well, what do you think? Would Jesus go to church on Sunday? And I said, well, you're killing me. (laughs) Of course Jesus would go. (laughs) And he said, well, then what do you think you should do? And I said, well, doggone it. I need to go too then. And he's like, well, then maybe you should call your boss and tell him you need Sundays off. And I said, he's going to fire me. Hmm. And he said, well, why don't you pray and trust God and see what he does? So I called my boss. I was just, I wasn't, I wasn't baptized yet. I called my boss and I was the atheist on the club all those years before I was the guy getting drunk and, um, um, hung over the next day with dark glasses on teaching kids tennis. And so I called my boss and I said, boss, I need, I need Sunday off. And he's like, are you kidding me? Why? And I said, well, um, I uh, want to go to church. <laughs> he was like, you have got to be kidding me. Oh my gosh. He's like, I was waiting for 300 different answers, but I never thought you'd say the word church. And, and he said, forget it. No, if you, if you're, if you need Sundays off, you're fired. And I said, okay, then I quit. And he said, are you serious? You're going to give up a fi- you're going to give up this job to go to church. And I said, well, and I'm thinking in my mind, I've lost my mind. Mm. Am I really going to say this? Right. And I said, yeah, I'll, I, you know, if I can't have Sunday off, I'm, I can't take the job. And he said, call me back in a month. I'll let you know if you still have the job. And like a week later, I became a Christian. And then I called him back. And I was already totally fired up. Whatever God decides is fine. So I called him back. I said, look, he said, so how do you feel? Do you still need Sundays off? And I said, yeah. And I said, it's it's a deal breaker for me. And he said, okay, well, then I'll give you a raise all the other days of the week to make up for the money you'll lose on Sunday. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And I just felt like God, unbelievable. I was in charge of all of his kids' clinics during the week, yeah. so all the kids really liked me. Yeah. But on the weekends is when you teach the adults, and that where you, that's where you make the serious money. Right. So he felt like I was giving up a chance just to make a lot of money, mm-hmm. and he would let somebody else take that role, which is a very prestigious role, and I was willing just to take the pay cut and come wow. work with the kids. Got so it. he gave me a raise, Got but it. then he fired me. We had a we had a conversion in the Hamptons while I was up there. <laughs> um, there was a girl who became a Christian, and then. And then, and then I got fired, basically. He said, nope, you can't have Sundays off. And I said, okay, then I'm done. Wow. Packed my bags and went home. So he changed his mind later. Yeah, he did. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of him. Uh, so. Wow. That is, that's fascinating. Now, okay. So from there, you became a Christian, you graduated, and then you went straight to Moscow. Tell me your path to the Moscow mission team. Right. So actually, um, Moscow was planted summer of 91. Um, I moved over there summer of 92. I went on the second wave. So Moscow had an incredible growth uh, of like 800 people the first year. And they felt like the, the, the harvest was so ripe that instead of completely depleting Moscow of all of its leadership, they brought 10 more Americans over 
to split them up between Kiev and St. Petersburg. Okay. Um, so I went on that team. So yeah, I became a Christian in January. Um, I actually went into the ministry in March. Um, so when I was two months old as a Christian, they made me a part-time intern <clears throat> at the University of Kansas. Then I went to New York, ended up coming back, um, was a part-time campus minister with Steve Schmidt, awesome brother. Um, I think he's in San Antonio right now. And, um, but when I was home uh, for Thanksgiving, I guess I was 10 months old in the Lord. Um, I went out to LA for Thanksgiving just to spend some time with some brothers and to meet um, with a couple of the leaders in LA. Um, but when I got out there, it turned out they had some things going on and they were very busy. And um, they gave me a Kip's number and told me just to give him a call um, and tell him I'm in town. Um, and uh, so I gave him a call and uh, he said, well, you know, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I just came out to see some people, but it turns out it's not a good timing. And he, he remembered me, actually. I met him at the Jacob Javits Center when the Moscow Church was sent out of New York. <laughs> so... I went up and introduced myself to him. And I think it kind of stuck out in his mind who I was because I was a tennis pro in the Hamptons and his boys had just started playing tennis. So I think there was okay. an association with right. that. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think he just has a really good memory too. So yes. he remembered me and he said, so, you know, what are you doing when you graduate? And I said, well, I think I'm going to move back to New York and go in the ministry. Um, because when I got fired, New York asked me to stay and just, joined the campus ministry there, but I decided to go back to Kansas, finish, and then go back to New York later. And he said, well, let's talk about that. And he, he invited me over the next day to, to help him do some Christmas shopping. And um, that's when they were looking for 10 Americans to go help support the, the planting of Nova Siberia, St. Petersburg, and Kiev. So God just orchestrated that I just happened to be in LA and happened to meet up with him as, he's, as he was looking for 10 more Americans. Wow. So um, so within two hours, he asked me if I would move, uh, to Kiev, Ukraine. And, you know, I'm the worst person in geography and world history there ever was. <laughs> I thought it was a chicken dish. I had no idea it was a country <laughs> in a city. So I, you know, I was like, and I think he saw the, 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 the naivety and the, right. the, the excitement in my eyes. And he, and he looked at me and he said, he said, just so you know, this is for better, for worse, for sickness or health until death do you part. And he said, this is not a, this is, you, you can only go if you're going to lay down your life for the people over there. And this was right on the, 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 I'm sure Andy shared right on the heels of when the, the original team in Moscow stayed after the coup. So we were the only group that stayed. Uh, so, you know, it's an all in type thing because you're introducing Christianity for an entire nation, right. for an entire culture. It can't, it can't be because you're, you you want to just have another experience or something. So he tried to scare me, but I was still, it was, I'd been praying every day since I was baptized that God would send me somewhere. So this was the answer to my prayer. So um, did you say yes, right on the spot? I did, but then he told me to think about it and pray about it. There so I thought about it, prayed about it, and then also looked up where is Kiev in the encyclopedia, <laughs> <laughs> just so I could say I knew where it was, just in case he was going to ask me any deeper questions. Okay, so so that summer, you you that spring, you graduated ninety two from yeah. So University that was I was invited over Thanksgiving to to move, and then I graduated in May. And when did, um, and when, then I moved moved. When did you fly out to? Did you go to Moscow to Kiev or? So we went to LA and of course this, this, uh, this put a major tear in my family um, just because, you know, my parents have no really religious background. And in the course of basically six months, I've gone from being an atheist to someone who's moving to the Soviet union. Oh my gosh. They so, must have just thought you're out of your mind. Yeah. So my mom totally freaked out. Oh yeah. Uh, I can imagine. She, she was yeah, she took a nosedive after that. And then my dad hired people to deprogram me, basically, mm. to kidnap me and carry me out into the forest and, and convince me that I've lost my mind. Yeah. Luckily, I figured that out and flew out of the state and uh, hid. Oh, you, uh, so you, I, you got alerted to it, apparently. Yeah, I figured it out. Um, so, 
so yeah, that was, so then launched. Yeah. We launched in May. We all went out to LA for three weeks and my girlfriend or the girl I was dating before I became a Christian, she was invited on the team as well. Um, so the two of us were both on the team. And then the day before the team launched, uh, she was asked to step off the team. Um, so I was given a choice. I could stay home um, or I could go, um, but I had to make make a choice. So I just trusted God that if it was meant to be, um, God would work it out. And uh, if not, then um, I just need to go where God has opened the door for me to go. So that was challenging. I bet it was. I felt like, God, I, felt like I was stripped of everything. Mm. Um, basically, my my mom couldn't look me in the eye or talk to me. My dad didn't want to talk to me. My older brother, who's not a Christian, thought I'd lost my mind. My younger brother was proud of me because he was a Christian. <laughs> but, you know, it's, 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 it's the aroma of death or the fragrance. It's, it's one or the other. You're either right. people, people think you're insane and they don't have anything to do with you or they think you're doing a great thing. So very polarized. Oh, my gosh. That, that must have been so raw emotionally it was and you know when i'd landed there it's like my mom's like so can you leave me the phone number where you'll be and i was like well no and she's like do you have your address and i said no and you know there's no email there's no internet right. there's right and it was illegal you couldn't call out of the soviet union to america um so i couldn't even call home if i wanted to um you have to order a call through helsinki and then they place it the next day oh my gosh so i literally fell off the map so, you know, I, I feel for my parents, that's quite a, that was quite an initiation into the, into the kingdom. Into the exactly. Fellowship. Oh boy. Talk about whiplash. That would, that would be challenging. So, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about your, that first year in, uh, Kiev or in, in Russia, wherever mm -hmm. you're at. What was it? What was the experience like coming from the States? Uh, -huh. well, um, well, and, and things have changed a lot, obviously, in Russia and the Ukraine the last 20 some years. Uh, um, but it was it was very, very different. I mean, it was it was it was crazy different. And, um, you know, lo lots of things in, in every facet. It was different that the, the actual church planting was different from what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. um, the loneliness that settles in when you can't talk to people. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. It, 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 but it, you know, every challenge has its blessing, right? So the loneliness forced me to talk to God way much more mm -hmm. than I had the tendency to do before. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, where before I could just pick up a phone and talk to anybody in the States that I know could help me. But when you're out there on the mission field and you can't speak to the people you're converting, I mean, maybe 5%, 5% speak English. So you go for a walk with a brother and, and you just kind of walk silently by each other. I mean, you, just, <laughs> you, you use the 20 words, you know, and then you just walk next to them and they'd pray in Russian. I don't understand a word they're saying. I pray in English. They don't understand a word I'm saying. Oh, we hug each other and we yeah. go home and it's, oh my gosh. You, you trust that God is working, yeah. but you know, I think I became uh, yeah, it was, it was challenging and you know, several, I don't know, a third of the team, uh, you know, didn't make it. Um, you know, they lost their way. Um, you're talking about the Americans that came on the team, right? Yeah. Yeah. During that time or they, they left later, uh, some, a couple during that time. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it takes a toll. Um, I really like that in your book. You, you have to be, you got to find that connection with God. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, but God, God blessed me. Um, I was incredibly humbled when we planted. This. So I flew over and there was a St. Petersburg team and a Kiev team. And I was on the St. Petersburg team and the St. Petersburg team went with the Kiev team to plant Kiev so I that see. the St. Petersburg team could get some experience. Then St. Petersburg came back and then planted St. Petersburg. Okay. Um, so, but when I went to Kiev, God humbled me in a mighty way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was so arrogant and so worried about myself and what do I look like? And will I have visitors and will I have studies? And, and I mean, I was so full of myself. There was, there was no space for the 4 million lost people in the Ukraine. It was just all about me. Mm -hmm. It was just, um, so I was, and it was incredible because the first three weeks there were 77 people baptized in the Kiev church. Oh, it, okay. Every, wait, wait a second. Say that again. In the first three weeks, there were 77 people baptized. 
in in the first three weeks of the Kia planting, 77 people baptized. Yeah, 28 the first Sunday. After the first Sunday service, the next Sunday, 28 people were baptized. Oh, and then, my gosh. And then by the end of the three weeks, the end of the month, basically, because we started June 6th, by the end of June, it was at 77. Um, which sounds like incredibly open, but... You know, I did the math and it and it kind of pans out to being very similar to today, <laughs> just in the sense if you have a team of 30 people inviting a thousand people a week, that's 30,000 invitations. About 28 people became Christians out of the 30,000 invitations, which basically means, you know, we invited about a thousand people to find one open soul. Wow. Um, and then we did that for three weeks. So, you know, I just think you know, the harvest is still plentiful. Um, I just think the amount of dedication and devotion to massively sharing our faith, that was a unique, that's something that I think, um, you know, I think God worked through that. But interesting enough, out of the 77 baptisms, the first three weeks, I was the only guy on the team who didn't help anybody become a Christian. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> dude i mean i thought okay the spirit left me i fell away this is, Can I this get restored? is must be aching sin somewhere in there totally oh my gosh well when i know what the sin was i was the most arrogant haughty oh gosh oh my gosh that, that was a brutal time well that's so i left kiev and only after i left kiev did somebody who i invited actually get baptized but only after i left oh gosh. Uh, um then I went to St. Petersburg with Derek Vett, and uh-huh. um, I was literally nervous before the first service. And I said, Derek, I'm just afraid God won't work for me again. Uh-huh. I'm just so afraid. Uh-huh. And um, and we he took he grabbed my hands and he got down on his knees and we prayed together. And um, I just prayed for to be an empty vessel and humble. And you know, God blessed. And in St. Petersburg, we had tons of people become Christians. Um, basically four or five guys I helped become Christians in the first month. And then we started a campus ministry together, the five of us and uh, the church or the, the, the campus, the South campus ministry grew from five to 120 uh, by the end of January. So, Oh my gosh. So, okay. And, and how long was that? When did you plan it? Um, kind of the big first week of August. Okay, so, so August, September, October, November, December. So in like four months, it grew from five people to five. Five months, basically. That's just the campus ministry. It was just campus, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's amazing! I was personally leading ten Bible talks, so I don't actually recommend anybody <laughs> imitating my life. <laughs> ten Bible talks. <laughs> there was one time when Derek Vett said, "Hey, could you sit in my living room just for a moment?" And then he walked out, locked the door, and left me in there for five hours. <laughs> he said, "Dude." You're going to rest. I've had it with your schedule. I'm not letting you out of here until you take a nap. Oh gosh. You were, you were so driven. Just that's crazy. It was crazy. Now, how did, in that, uh, go ahead. Was this when you met Elena? How did you meet Elena? Uh huh. Yes. So I met her during a date when I first arrived in Moscow. Um, but, uh, the first time we started to kind of like I invited her on a date. It was in like March, um, March 92. No, 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 no. Yeah, 93. So I'd basically been in the former Soviet Union for about seven months at that point. Um, And basically, um, you know, Andy, they had dreams to plant more churches. So there was a church in Novosibirsk, St. Petersburg and Kiev but we wanted all four of those churches to plant another church the next year. Um, so all of us missionaries were targeted for another church, which I think is important in building because when I went to St. Petersburg, I clearly understood from day one, I'm not staying. So from day one, I was looking at who I'm going to raise up to take my spot. Mm-hmm. And um, I built always, you know, Andy trained us to always build trying to replace yourself. Mm-hmm. What does this ministry look like next week without me? Yeah. And uh, don't build yourself into your ministry. Uh, build yourself out of your ministry. That's how we multiply. That's how we um, empower people to have their own dreams. So even if you don't end up going, um, I think that was really, really wise. But we were planning on leaving. So um, basically, uh, I was told I was going to plant the church in Minsk, Belarus, 
Um, but then some things happened, some things changed, and the leader of um, Kiev was going to move to America to get ready to go plant the church in Budapest, uh, Tomi Kukta. So they wanted to find someone that would actually go and lead Kiev. Um, and at that time, Andy and Tammy asked me, so Sean, who do you like? And I was like, well, who likes me? You know, I'm afraid the risk. <laughs> I'm afraid the risk is, I'm like, um, and Tammy and Andy very gently said, dude, could you have a conviction about something? Like, what is it you want out of life? Quit waiting for someone to tell you what you think is. So that was good. And I thought, okay, that's right. I need to have a conviction about who I like and who I want to build a relationship with. So I go back to the office in Moscow before I go to back to St. Petersburg. And I was talking to a brother. I said, so bro, who do you like? And he says, oh man, I really like Lena. She's awesome. And I said, yeah, tell me why you like Lena. He said, she's spiritual and she's smart and she's a law student and she's sporty and athletic and she's funny and she's kind and she wants to do great things for God. Like he listed everything I was dreaming of. And I said, that's the one. <laughs> that's the one. I didn't tell him. I, I didn't tell him. Thank you for just telling me who I should. So, but immediately I went back to St. Petersburg. I got her number and I said, I'm going to take this girl out for a date. This is going to be perfect. So I called her and she spoke almost no English. I spoke. I mutilated the Russian language. Um, so, but I asked her out on a date and um, we went on a date. Uh, and then uh, came back two months later to go on a second date. Um, but when I came back two months later on the second date, that's when uh, they decided to speed up the plan. And when I came into town, they said, Sean, actually, the original plan was that I moved to Moscow, work with Andy for three months. Then they send me Kiev, send me to Kiev. But uh, they said, we need to speed things up. Tommy needs to go to Budapest earlier. So we actually want to ask you not to go back and get your stuff in St. Petersburg. Just go to the store and buy some T-shirts and underwear and jeans. <laughs> if you could leave tomorrow for Kiev to start leading the church. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh. I said, and with who? And Andy said, well, let's see how your second date goes with Lynn. If it goes well, maybe you can go with her. <laughs> oh, this is, this is, this is, so, this, you know, th totally it needs to be a, up. this needs to be a TV show. This really does. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> so on our, and, I, and he said, he's like, so how do you feel about Lynn? I said, oh, dude, she's perfect for me. I love her. She's awesome. I, and he said, well, then maybe she should go with you to Kiev. And, and he's like, well, if you're sure, why don't you go and ask her to be your girlfriend? And I was like, okay, awesome. <laughs> Perfect. I think Andy was a little concerned, you know, for us to be down there not dating and trying to leave the church. And, right. you know, I think he was trying to, you know, also protect purity because sure. I didn't realize it at the time. But Andy's like, dude, purity, 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 purity. He's like, mm -hmm you guys have got to be careful. Yeah. And, and I'm not real careful. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I can be, sometimes we joke that my wife has a conscience for the two of us. Right. Um, but I'm really thankful that we had a pure relationship. And because, you know, looking back at it, and we fast tracked it. I mean, we were dating. Um, after three months, we were engaged. Um, after three months, we were gonna get married, but then we stopped it, broke off the engagement and delayed it for a few months and ended up getting married a year after we started dating. Um, it wasn't a purity issue at all. It was a stress in managing our relationship while trying to lead the church. Right. So we took a break and slowed it down, which at the time I didn't understand, but I, now looking back, it's like God intervened. Wow. Um, just to, to help us have a stronger founda foundation before we started. Um, but you know, if you mess up the purity and you're the young church leader and all those young kids are looking at you, you've damaged, you've damaged things for yeah. years to come. Absolutely. And, um, oh my gosh. So absolutely. God, God protected us. God's awesome. Okay. So let me clarify. So you went on one date, you liked her and then you're going on the second date. And that's when Andy said, well, why don't the second time just ask her to go steady? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very simple. And so then, it is. <laughs> so you guys went steady and then she went with you to Kiev. Yeah, actually our next date, <clears throat> because I jumped on a train that night to go to Kiev. Um, our next date was in Kiev two days later. And that's when we started dating. Oh my. So it was on our second date. We started dating. That's, 
That's and you have to understand that that date was based on almost no Russian and almost no English. <laughs> lots of meaning. Was, uh, did, lots of meaningful did you say looks Jesus and smell. Lord, that's good enough for me. <laughs> I'm good to go. Wow, that's that's an incredible story. I now, don't recommend that for everybody. Okay, but. so now you've got uh, how many kids? How many kids do you have? Two. You've got two. Yeah. So Andrew's twenty. He'll be twenty four this year, and our daughter Diana. Um, is 18. So Andrew yeah. and Diana. Uh-huh. We oh. call her Gunya, but her name is Diana. Wow. So they're almost out of the house here. At least uh, my son's out of the house. He finished university <clears throat> and he's actually quarantined in Moscow right now, uh, working for his company. Wow. Um, so he's, he's fine. He's doing well. Um, and Diana's in the room next door studying at university. Okay. Also quarantined. So, so she's going to school there in, in Ukraine, in Kiev, yeah. freshman, mm-hmm. sophomore, something like that. Freshman. Okay. Uh-huh. That's great. Now, yeah. Sean, here's, here's the thing that really stands out to me about you is in 2003, there was a major restructuring in our family of churches, um, Funding got cut dramatically. So many people came back, so many foreign missionaries. And yet Mm -hmm. you stayed. I mean, you've been overseas since the time you're talking about there. Uh, Why Mm -hmm. didn't you come back? What what happened? How did, how are you the one that that's still going? Mm, Good question. Um, Well, I think of course, God has been the biggest support and encouragement. I think my wife, she's like, my compass. Um, you know, I think, I think that probably and at the time in 2003, I was actually working for hope worldwide. Um, we were always doing ministry, leading a super region or leading a church, or, you know, we were always planting churches or leading ministries. But at that moment I was working for hope in Moscow. And when 2003 hit, um, you know, hope worldwide took a big hit. Uh, in several of the GHLs, that was kind of like the, the world sector leader equivalent of a HOPE coordinator. I was working with Marty and Chris Fuqua with, for the Northern Federation for HOPE. Um, but at this moment, the Gimples were also looking to replace themselves. And uh, they wanted me and Lena to step into their role um, of leading HOPE. Um, and in the meantime, they kind of promoted us to kind of like their VP um, and in t- when 2003 hit, what we did is me and Lena and our two kids came to America and got in a minivan and hit church to church to church to church to church <laughs> to try and explain why they should not quit funding mm-hmm. hope. Mm-hmm. Um, what we do is we go to a city for three days. My wife would cook a Russian meal with borscht <laughs> and everything to try and warm the hearts. Cause there was a lot of, uh, mistrust at the time. Sure. And I would answer every question from Alpha to Omega about hope. And and I'm living at that moment, you know, in the former Soviet Union, which, you know, gives me some credibility that I'm not in this for me, obviously. Right. Um, I'm trying to take care of the orphans that are going to bed crying in my arms every night. Can you can you throw us a bone? I got right. I got elderly people starving. Right. Please don't stop. Right. And um so we'd spend three days in a city, pack up our car and go to the next city. And we did that for six months. We went from one side of the U.S. to the other and visited almost 100 churches. Thanks to that, I was able to meet almost everybody in our movement. Right. <laughs> and I've been I've been in the homes of almost everybody. Um, so we have a lot of dear, great memories from all that. But so that was 2003 to 2005, uh, pretty much trying to hold on to hope. Um and we were kind of being pushed to come to the States or in, encouraged is probably a better word to come to the States and start to lead hope, but it never sat right with us. Mm. Um, I was going through a really bad time spiritually in 2005 in Moscow. Um, we were kind of um, a little bit sidelined and we kind of stopped serving in the church. We, we were asked not to really, you know, we were leading a sector. We weren't leading a family. We actually weren't even leading a small group. Um, so, and that lasted for about a year and I started to lose hope and get discouraged. And my wife always felt like we can't leave here because there's so few, there's so few leadership in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. And when you go to America, there's so much leadership. Um, 
you know, you visit LA and or you visit New York or some of these churches that have thousands, they say we really have big needs, and you you realize they do have needs, but right. compared to a continent, right? You you know, you can't even compare the the level of spirituality and the resources that are available. So, and this is a little off topic, but I think it's important as I kind of think about what you would want me to share. I think one of the reasons I stayed out there is because um, we got to people, we got to have people that go out there and stay. Right. Um, you got to stay. It's a life work. Right. It's not something you come in for four years and do it and it is just going to go. Right. Um, you know, and I think uh, there was a great brother, um, well, it's, I'm blanking his name, uh, Dr. Gumley, who's in Australia. Graham Gumley. Uh, yeah, Ra- yeah, Graham Gumley. And he was in Cambodia. And one of the times we visited Cambodia, and he's this famous hand surgeon right. who's in this hospital in Cambodia. And I'm like, Graham, why, what motivates you to stay here? I mean, right. explain that to me. And he said, well, you know, I can do an operation in the United States and save someone's life. And it feels really good to use your gifts to save someone's life. But I realized if I didn't come to work that day, there's five other doctors that could have done that exact same operation and saved that person's life. But he said in Cambodia, if I don't show up, that person dies. Hmm. And he said, you can count the amount of doctors that can do what I can do on one hand for this entire country. And I could be replaced in the hospital by 20 people that can do what I can do. Maybe I'm a little better than them, but still. Uh, And I think that contrast always kind of stayed in my head after that. I mean, Eastern Europe's a group of 21 countries, um, like zero elders. Um, You know, in most of these countries, less than 30 or 40 Christians for an entire country. Right. Six of the countries, no church at all. And I'm sure we could be used in a great way in America. And I'm sure we could be helpful. I'm right. sure of that. But on the backdrop of the despair and poverty in the desert of some of these nations, and we just feel like we we have 24 years of experience of this mentality, um, this culture, um, where it just takes years to learn some of these things. We just feel like this is the place God can best use us. It doesn't mean we need to stay here. Right. I mean, you can look at Peter and Paul and argue that Paul would be better for the Jews and Peter better for the Gentiles and God flipped it. So I'm not saying not everything has to be logical, but um, we just felt like we should stay as long as it's possible. Right. That's, um, a, that's, a, it's, that's flat out inspiring. Totally inspiring. Now, let me double back on something you mentioned. You, you went on this massive road trip, which just sounds like so much fun. And I'm sure it was fun mixed with a little bit of uh, kind of craziness. Day. But you met everybody, and I think that's one thing that really stands out to me about you, Sean, is that you are probably the most well-known person in the kingdom of God. I mean, you've spoken to so many different teen groups and, and youth groups all over. Um, you're, a, you're a connector. I mean, even when you're sharing about going to the Hamptons to make connections with uh, you know, high net worth individuals, this is like your gift set. And I'm sure it must have benefited you. I know that you do a lot of fundraising. You did it for Hope, and then you're 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 doing it for a current project you're doing for Eastern Europe that we're going to talk about. Um, how important is it for you? And and for a person who's uh, a young achiever and he's really trying to crank and 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 really grow, how important is it to build relationships? Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, I'm I'm probably to a fault uh, dependent on relationships. I think the, those couple of years when I couldn't really have close relationships helped me get closer to God, hmm. for sure. I think that was an important step in the in the big picture. But um, relationships, I get a lot from them. I mean, from my coach, from my tennis days, um, you know, I find them invaluable. Um, I feel like there's just so much to learn from different brothers and sisters. Every brother and sister is like this miraculous story, right? And then everyone who's serving in the ministry has learned so many things right. like, um, you know, and, and I also believe God has a special plan for everybody, right? Like, you know, first Peter four, um, uh, God's given everyone gifts to be used to, to build up his kingdom. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, any relationship God gives me, I just believe there's something that can happen with that relationship that could cause something impossible to happen right um 
whether that person could become a Christian or whether me and them can do something together to do something awesome for God. And, um, you know, so I think that's a plus. I'd say the, the, the minus side with me, on the other hand, is that there's so many and I don't do well maintaining expectations. And I think, you know, I, I think I don't manage that well. I, I think I let people down. I think that's one of my weaknesses. I think even you've experienced a little of that trying to get a hold of me to get this this call set up. It probably was I probably wasn't the easiest person uh, to get this thing set up with. I don't I don't know. Well, I, I understand um, you're busy, and I think the the thing that impresses me here is is that you are a connector, and even though you are in Kiev, Ukraine, and you, you said yourself, a lot of Americans don't even know where that is, or you know, the only time they hear about it is recent scandals and in, in Ukraine. But still, you've been able to maintain great relationships, which is a credit mm. to your desire to stay connected. I mean, you could have easily mm. just dropped up, disappeared, and been the whatever happened to you know Sean Wooten from '92 right. or something like that. But it's not that way. And I think a lot of mm. uh, you know leaders, small group leaders, um, people in small churches, young leaders, campus leaders, they're so focused on themselves that they're not thinking mm. about hey, I, I need the strength of other people around me. And I think that's mm. just massive. I know for myself, I can totally go in that direction where I, I'm not connected to people. I'm just doing my own thing. And mm. I think that's a great quality and something that, that you bring to the table. And I, I'm sure it is hard to keep track of everybody, but uh, it's mm. definitely something that, that stands out and I think <clears throat> needs to be noted. Um, mm. tell, me, tell me a little bit about this struggle in 2005. How'd you come back from it? You know, a lot of people, we all go through major struggles in our lives. And there's people listening that are feeling like, you know, I've been sidelined. I used to be awesome. Mm. I used to be super mm. strong. I used to be on fire. Now I'm not believed in. I'm, 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 mm. I'm on the bench or I'm, I'm in the stands. I'm not in the, I'm not on the floor. Mm. How'd you get back on your feet and what'd you learn from that? Mm. Um, well, I had, a couple of great friends. <laughs> there you go again. Um, Relationships. Yeah. Okay. And I think I think you're right, bro. I think um, relationships are just so important. Um, you know, and I had three buddies in Moscow, and these are people I actually appointed, and then they stayed in their roles, and then I was in their region, but really not allowed to to lead anything. <laughs> don't don't touch <laughs> anything. <laughs> so, so, but they would get with me every week. And they would just encourage me and love up on me. And um, so they were a huge help. And then my wife was awesome. Uh, she was like, you know, she she kept believing in us and me. Um, you know, and then I just did the best with what I could, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we worked with Hope and um, did the best we could with Hope. And Hope flourished. Um, we came up with a lot of great programs. Um, I got a, a, a reward from Putin's wife and, um, you know, all kinds of different things happened. Got to meet Michael Jackson. Wow. You know, my, my wife was called into the mayor of Moscow for one of his sessions. Um, so there's lots of great things that happen and hope, you know, there's no reason to look at something and think, why can't I do that? Why don't I just do what's right in front of me? Let's mm -hmm. just do, let's just focus on this then. And if mm -hmm. God wants to open up that door later, he will. Mm -hmm. um, so. I think that was the, that was the thing. So we finally started to lead a small group and then that small group turned into a sector. Hmm. Um, you know, so we just, I just think God, God will teach us something no matter where we're at. Right. And there's always good that comes out of it. Mm -hmm. I remember, I think it also, that I think that moment kind of really strengthened our marriage just because we were always so busy. We never really had time hmm. uh, just for each other. Right. You know, we, we started dating, leading the Kiev church, and it was 200. <laughs> uh, we got married when the church was 700. Mm. So from our wedding day, the church is 700, and we led it up to 1,600 in the next year. And then we moved to Moscow to take on a super region of 1,000 and start Hope Worldwide for the former Soviet Union. And me and Lena, we were just always running 3,000 miles an hour. We just never stopped in sat at each other's feet and said, so how are you doing? 
Wow. <laughs> I mean, it was like, there was just, it was just so fast. And I think right. God slammed on the brakes and maybe the situation didn't seem righteous to me, but he always uses it for the good. Oh my gosh. It, I've always looked back at moments where I felt like that wasn't fair, quote unquote fair, although God forbid we ever get fair. Um, you know, and he always works for the good. That's great. Um, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about this whole, um, you know, Mary, you just talked about God slamming on the brakes. And I think that there's times when people feel like, you know, I'm in the doghouse or, you know, God's mad at me or something like that. And, and it almost, I've noticed at times life is so long, you know, God, God is on his own timetable. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes we can f make the wrong deduction about what's happening in our lives and feel like, um, I've been, you know, put off, you know, taken off the team or something like that. When in fact, God is doing something inside of us. I, I think about like Joseph, you know, the mm -hmm. being sold into slavery or going into, to the prison. And for him, it must have been a real test. Like, what did I do wrong? And in fact, mm -hmm. God was doing something to make him stronger. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's Amen. very, very powerful for, for people listening and, and for all of us just to mm -hmm. go, okay, Hey, I might, I may not see it or feel it, but God is doing something and I'm still going to be, I'm going to come out of here more productive. And I think that's, what's mm. so impressive, Sean, is that you, you, you had a time of struggle, but look at what you're doing now. You're, you, you are bearing even more fruit. Mm. Any, any thoughts on that? No, I, well, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. I think, um, you know, he always has good intentions for us and um any kind of resistance or suffering uh just helps us to be more like christ and mm -hmm. have more compassion mm -hmm. uh, for people who suffer in similar ways so i absolutely think that's true um you know i had my dad just pass in december and um you know when when you lose people you can become discouraged um and when i lost my mom also you know i basically Five months after I moved to St. Petersburg, that's when my mom passed away. Oh so I, I I couldn't get back in time. I couldn't get out of the Soviet Union to get back in time. And she died like two seconds before the new year. Mm. And um, it was like, you know, there's sometimes when you when you have these questions and and what I've decided with my life is that I have to be able to explain every event in my life that it was for my good and that it was an expression of love. Mm. And I'll wrestle in prayer until I get there because I, I refuse to accept that God's not loving me always. Mm. And that even if he's disciplining me, it's absolutely in love with this mm. great vision and dream for me on the other side. Right. So I think that optimism or that hopefulness that it's always working out for the good. Mm. Um, I think there's just been so many crazy things that have happened in my life that, um, you know, from Chernobyl to the mafia, to the KGB, to everything that's gone on. And every time I look back, the stories I would ever sit down and tell you about that I think are most helpful are all the ones where I felt like my life is literally unraveling <laughs> and nothing's going the way it's supposed to. And, it's... you know, the Bible is filled with a lot of those stories too. So I just think we just have to know how to hold on to God at yeah, that moment. That's true. The, the power of perseverance and patience is so valuable. Yeah. Thank you. And for I've sharing always that. heavily uh, relied on fasting as well. Mm. When things get really tough, I fast. Um, Cause I don't know how else to deal with the pressure. Mm. Um, I want to know that God is definitely invoking his power in some situations kind of only get driven out by prayer and fasting. So when we had the coup four years ago and the war and uh, it looked like Russia and Ukraine were going to hate each other. And my wife's Russian. I'm living in Ukraine. I'm trying to keep all this work unified. Mm. I mean, it was, it was unbearable. Our kids couldn't go to school because of sniper attack and the, the police was gone. And, and, you know, there's that chaos. And I think I fasted that year almost half the days. I mean, I fasted like 130 or 140 days that year. Um, uh, a 40-day fast, a 30-day fast, every month 10 days, 
um, sometimes two or three days, almost every week. Oh my gosh. How did you do a 40 day fast? Well, I I have coffee. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That's zero cal. That's zero calories, energy, no no calories. Cappuccinos was my diet, basically cappuccinos. Um, but no sugar. Um, I used to try and do water fast, but then you just lay in your bed and you can't do anything for the Lord anyways. Right. But, you know, it's like, it's like keto teaches once, once you get over to the three day hump and the 10 day hump, you just start burning fat and you have lots of energy. And luckily I had much fat to burn. So <laughs> I guess it all worked How much, out. okay. I know this is not a spiritual question, but how much weight did you lose after a 40 day fast? Um, I went from about 96 kilos down to like 83. So that's about 13 kilos. About 30 so pounds. Six, about 30 pounds. Wow. So, but I, I, it's, it, it's tough, but it's, it's one of the greatest, it's some of the greatest memories I have as a Christian because temptation literally flees. Mm. Um, lust, laziness, um, it just flees. Because if you can say no to food, um, which is such a primal instinct and desire, mm-hmm. once you, it, it's, it's, it's a special time. I mean, it is, a spe- you have so much free time because you're not cooking and eating and, you your, know. Your wife must have loved it. No, no cooking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. First wow. three days are always hard, but after three days, it gets easier. Okay. So, well, let's just take a little detour on that one. I'm sure there are people listening going, I'd like to fast. That's 40 days seems crazy. 30 days. How? Yeah, what, what would be baby steps? Like what would a person thinking, yeah, I want to fast. I'd like to have a meaningful fast. What, what three things could you tell them to do? Um, <clears throat> you know, I think, I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I mean, sure. I don't know who it is I'm talking to. Maybe you want to talk to a doctor, um, but I think the first day is hard. The second day is harder. By day three, it gets easier. Mm. Um, once you get over th- day three, it kind of goes away into like day seven, mm. and then you're a little bit hungry. But then by day ten, you literally are not hungry. Um, I played the number eight Ukrainian tennis player in the country on my like 15th day of fasting and I beat him when I hadn't played in like a couple of years. <laughs> uh, I just think the Lord, you know, you just, you just, you're walking in his presence. You have strength, you have wow. spiritual strength. Wow. Um, but I like 10 days the, the entire time I led the Kiev church for that year and a half. I led the Kiev church. I would fast 10 days a month. That was just standard. Wow. Um, so every month, 10 days, um, I would fast for God to grow the church so that no one would fall away, that tons of people would become Christians. I just begged God. And and the whole staff would most of the time fast with me. Um, so I just think we cried out to God like in just a crazy way. Um, That's inspiring. That is totally awesome. Ten days. We month. really didn't know what we were doing. Hmm. But we were incredibly zealous. Now this is back um, in the early '90s when you when you were called down there and you just met Elena and everything. Okay, so right '93, uh huh. So tell me, what have you seen? So, I mean, what fruit has that produced? Like, what have you seen that you said you you felt like you're walking with Christ? Temptation flees. Any other benefits of fasting that you could encourage somebody with? Um, any any miracles you've well, seen think- as a result of that? Oh, well, yeah, there's a ton of miracles um, that God did. I think if if I talk about the conviction and the foundation, sometimes I don't understand what God is doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love the moment when Jesus said this can only, co-, like, if it's really stuck, like if, 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 if the, you know, I don't know, Satan's got his claws in there or whatever, the demon's really holding on to whatever it is, um, Jesus reassures us that, that it can come out if we pray and fast, right? Mm -hmm. So if I really pray and fast about something, then I can really trust that this result is definitely God's will. Mm -hmm. Um, I can trust this. It may not be what I want, um, but I can trust that God is definitely working for the good. And I feel like if I just pray about it, but I don't fast, in my just from my mind and my convictions and my heart, I feel like, did I put it all out there? 
And I, and I don't think it has to be 10 days or 40 days, right. like June, but I'll take a day to fast. If it's anything significant, if I feel like we're stuck, mm -hmm. if we're stuck with anything, if, if there's a brother who I love who's stuck, if the government is stuck, if Chernobyl's on fire, whatever's going on, okay, I'm going to pray and fast mm -hmm. um, for this to get knocked out. That's a great um, go-to because, you know, how it, we're always getting stuck. I mean, I wish that weren't the case, but it's just the, the truth in our ministries. And I'm sure people listening have experienced that where they feel stuck in their marriage or they feel their, like their ministry stuck or they feel like my job, I'm stuck in my job or you know, there's so many sticking points that mm -hmm. what you're saying is that that's your go-to. That's your first thing right. is I'm going to pray and fast about this and ask God to get us past this point. So that's, that's, right. that's very powerful. Okay. So let's, let's go ahead and, and go back to your, your timeline. You were in Moscow in 2005. How'd you get to Ukraine? Like what, what path uh, did you take to get where you're at now? Um, well, well, so basically we agreed to take the job in Philly and come to Philadelphia and start to lead hope. Um, and, uh, we did, we agreed to do that. We were going to move a year later in like 2006. Um, at that moment, um, uh, Kip was, and we were in Moscow at the moment at that moment, Kip was trying to plant his church in Kiev. Um, and he tried to get people rattled people, um, because, you know, Kip preached the first, or Kip was on the church planting to Kiev. Right. So he's always been, he's always visited the Kiev church. And uh, I think he decided that was going to be one of the first international, it was the first international church he went after. Um, and uh, when I when I heard that, I thought, you know, we need to, me and Lena should go down to Kiev and protect uh, the church. Um, so I called him and I said, I'm coming um, to Kiev to, you know, I don't believe what what's going on is, is righteous or good. Or builds faith. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, I was prayerful and I thought, okay, well, we'll go to Kiev for a year before we move to America. And that kind of helps us uproot and make the move easier. Um, but once we moved to Kiev, um, at that moment, um, there was a situation in an orphanage in Romania with Hope. And um, I had to go there. And for whatever reason, we needed to shut it down. And um, then I was asked to go to Boston um, to, uh, meet up with Valder Koha to explain what happened. And cause he was one of the people who helped finance that, uh, orphanage big heart for the, the orphans there in Romania. So I flew to Boston and, and we started to spend time together and, um, you know, and I think it was a kind of a challenging time for him because of all the, the chaos and I just sat with him. I said, wow, God's given you so many gifts. There's just so much you could do to strengthen the kingdom. You know, don't get down. And then he turned around and started asking me the same questions. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, dude, don't you get down. I mean, what? Right. So then I went to church the next day and he had never heard me speak. And I preached on Sunday. And then we left church and he's like, I don't understand. And I said, what don't you understand? He said, I don't understand if you if you have that faith story and you've done this in the, this former Soviet union build churches like this, you know, why would you go to hope right, right. now? I don't under, why would you leave? Right. And I said, well, you know, it's been very challenging in this and that. And he's like, dude, I think you might be burying some of your talents. Hmm. If you do that, he said, there's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but are you sure that that's the right thing to do? Right. He saw, he saw your, your gift for preaching and your experience. And he said, Hey, that's hope, right. hope is a good thing, but it may not right. be your, your primary calling. It's something you, right. you can do on the side while you do your fine, your primary vocation. Right. That's that great. was his question. Yeah. So about a month later, things kind of were, you know, falling apart everywhere. And, uh, he and Dave Malutnok circled back to me and said, would you be interested in taking a job and helping strengthen the churches in Europe because basically most of the missionaries had all gone home um, and we were already on the mission field. So could we help? Um, could we engage? So, um, you know, we prayed and fasted about it and we decided we should go back into the ministry. So this was 2005 when, you know, Boston had just let go like 90% of their staff I mean, it was a very tough time kingdom wide. Everyone was still getting let go. Right. And we went back into the ministry. Wow. 
And um, I remember going to the Gimples to tell them that we were going to switch jobs. And God bless Pat. She has such a great heart for God's kingdom. You know, I said to him, I said, basically, you know, I'm thinking, you know, the Wootens probably won't come to Philly. We, I think we're, you know, we're going to go back into the ministry. And Pat's like, so where would you go into the ministry? And I said, well, I think Europe, which was just decimated. I mean, everyone was just fired. Right. Um, And we'd be supported by Boston where they were just firing everybody, basically. Mm -hmm. And she's like, if you thought this through, right? Um, my guess is that a year from now, you'll be out of a job. Um, and I said, well, you know, Pat, even if it's just for one more year, God asked me to serve full time. And then a year from now, I'm out of a job. I'll know for sure. I use my life the most sold out way I possibly could for God Mm. for the last 365 days, no regrets. (laughs) Um, And, you know, Pat's like, I agree. I mean, she, as much as she wanted (laughs) us to come to hope, she has a heart for God's kingdom and for saving souls. I mean, she's always been an inspiration to me. Um, Hope for her was not just a charity. It was saving souls always. Um, So that's kind of how that happened. That's how we, so, and so we you, took the you, job. You've been there since 2006. Yeah. So we moved to Kiev 2006 to, you know, with one intention, but we ended up staying. And for the first few years, we just focused on Europe and traveled a lot. Um, but then eventually we kind of settled down in Kiev to help the Kiev church. Okay. Um, and then two, two years ago, we moved out of any kind of leadership role in the Kiev church and we're focused now on the Eastern European churches. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about that Eastern Europe. Um, you're, you're going to have to help help us with Eastern Europe geography. Um, what countries are we talking about? How many churches are there? You, you, you talk, touched a little bit about it, 21 countries in Eastern Europe, six mm-hmm. countries with no churches. But how many disciples mm-hmm. are there now? If you can share some highlights, some challenges that you're facing, if you could just kind of give kind of the broad picture here of what we're talking about, about your work in, in Eastern Europe. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. So, yeah, um, Eastern Europe, at least the way we define it, obviously, I'm not sure Google would agree with Mm. everything I'm about to say, Um, but it's the Ukraine uh, we consider to be part of Eastern Europe. Obviously, geography, Eastern Europe includes part of Russia, but it's basically just the Ukraine, um, Moldova, and then you have Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, um, Slovakia, mm. um, Slovenia, um, all the Yugoslavian countries down there, uh, Tirana, uh, or Albania, Greece, uh, Turkey, Cyprus, um, the Baltics, that's Estonia, uh, Latvia, and Lithuania. We work with them as well. Um, Croatia, um, Serbia. So those, all those countries down in that area. So it's, it's just a vast area. I mean, you, you're it going up down into Turkey. That's, you know. That's 99% Muslim. Wow. It's, it's pretty different. Oh, my gosh. So it's a, okay, so that, how, many, how many churches are we talking? So that's 270 million people. It's 21 different fellowships. Every single country has its own language. And it's not like a European Union situation where they all kind of have an open border. Uh, they all have their own rules. Uh, six of the countries are in the EU, but the rest of the countries are not in the EU. Um, so it's all kind of uh, mixed up. It's some of the most corrupt places. You know, it's post-Soviet. Uh, so there is some cultural similarities. Um, the Muslim states are Turkey and Albania and Kosovo. Um, the rest is, then you have your strong Catholic groups like Poland, um, and then you just have a lot of atheism and agnosticism. So it's very diverse, um, very challenging. No middle class in most of these countries. You're either kind of poor or you're, you're corruptedly wealthy. Wow. Um, great hearted Christians, um, hospitality, you know, off the chart hospitality. <laughs> um, they may not have anything, but they'll put everything on the table and feed you yeah. and love you. And, um, so in beautiful part of the world, right? Most of the biblical land is in this part of the world. Right. Um, okay. So how many, how many disciples are we talking there? About 3,200, I think is the number. Okay. 
concentrated mostly in churches. like Kiev. Those are like the large churches, Kiev. And... Yeah, Kiev is the big church. The okay. number two church would be Odessa. That's the second largest church. Okay, and how many disciples um, now are there in Kiev? In Kiev, about 1,700. Oh my gosh, what a gr- big church. And you're not leading that church. You're just living there. Right. Yeah. Four years ago, we appointed an eldership, praise God. And then two years ago, uh, handed off to a new lead evangelist. And he's got his team of evangelists and he works with the elders and um, they're doing a great job leading the Kiev church. Okay. Now that's a Ukrainian national that's leading that? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And all the elders are Ukrainians. So it's a it's a completely homegrown, home converted, home raised up uh, leadership team of a church of a thousand seven hundred. So that's encouraging. And how many people in Odessa? Uh, three hundred, about okay. three twenty. Okay, so Sean, this is you've got a new growth initiative for Eastern Europe, mm. and um, tell me about why. What what's the reason for this? And just explain what you're doing. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's interesting when we planted churches in the beginning of our fellowship, um, there was a lot of effort that went into planting those churches. Um, you know, I talked with Scott and Lynn Green about how they planted Hong Kong, that they, they chose the team a year ahead of time. That team was together in Boston building dynamics. And then that team launched together and it's a team, right? It's like mm-hmm. eight, 10, 12 people. The Moscow church was planted with 12, 14 people. The Kiev church was planted with 12 people. St. Petersburg, 12 people. And Johannesburg was planted with a large team. The first churches in India. And those cities, Andy Andy Fleming did the statistical research that the cities that had strong, large plantings, they're the ones that broke through that Mm -hmm. certain level Mm -hmm. and are able to have that ongoing momentum to plant churches and send out churches and continue to evangelize their countries. Um, I think that, I think the, the, the year 2000 plan or whether the six year plan that we had to get churches in all the countries was incredibly visionary and necessary so that we didn't become self-focused on just where we were, but kept having a vision to get to all the nations. Right. But I think we became a slave to the timeline and I don't think we had the resources to plant the quality that we did in the beginning. So as you went into some of these smaller countries in Eastern Europe, as where is if I were to quiz probably people listening to this, list all the countries you know that are in Eastern Europe, that's hard to do. Right. So also attracting a team, attracting a team to Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Paris is one thing. Right. Attracting a team to uh, Pristina, uh, Montenegro is a different thing. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think we sent teams that were smaller, maybe four people, six people. Um, they weren't well-trained church leaders. They were good-hearted family group leaders right, right. who had a dream to be a part of this six-year plan. Mm. So I think all the intentions and all the hearts were noble, but we didn't count the cost well. Mm. So these churches weren't planted with a, a, with a critical mass of faith and evangelism to get that church up and growing. And I think it's very important. And that's why I love your book so much, Zero to 100. And uh, anyone listening to this, you you should always read Rob's book on Zero to 100. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, I think you have to get up to 100 in a short period of time mm-hmm. because it's building your genetic code of how you view church growth. Mm-hmm. If, if, if it takes forever and people don't see growth happening, then you just assume that's the way it is. Right. And, and the interesting thing, people we converted in Kiev, St. Petersburg, and Moscow in that first year, they're used to seeing baptisms every day. They had never seen a church without baptisms for every day. So when they go out and share their faith, they just expect it to happen. Mm-hmm. Although we were still sharing our faith a thousand times for everyone who came and became a Christian. Right. What, it's not like people were falling into the baptistry. Um, but... Everyone was just sharing. The average Christian would share their faith probably. The average new conversion was sharing their faith 20 to 30 times a day um, because that's all they saw the team doing every day. That's just right. what you do. Right. And it was it was hilarious. We had a sister from Kiev go to Odessa, and she got off the train and lost the address to where church was. And she didn't know how to find church on Sunday. So at 8 in the morning when the, church, when the, the train arrived, church is at like 10, 
She said, I know how I can find church because there were no cell phones or anything. She said, I'll go to the center of the city and I'll just stand there and someone will invite you. <laughs> so she got out of the train, walked to the center of the city and stood there with her suitcase waiting for a Christian to invite her because Christians were always inviting everybody in the center of the city to come to church. And true church, you know, God bless whoever it was, but somebody walked up to her like a half hour before church and said, hey, do you want to come to church? And she's like, I'm waiting for you guys to get me to come and invite me. I'm a Christian from Kiev. I just didn't know where church was. That's so hilarious. I think, I think when you have that kind of critical mass of just, right. hey, I may get rejected today. I may not, but this whole city is going to get invited to church. Right. And um, God is always working in the hearts of people. Um, you just never know when the right time is. And I think we have to recreate that culture. But anyways, those churches that were planted with smaller teams, some of them, like even when Kiev gets stuck now, there's still a genetic code. We right. can remember. Right. We know. Mm -hmm. We know what that can. Mm -hmm. We remember how we lived and we know what it looks like. But we have some churches who don't have that genetic code, who don't have that experience. So it's very hard to create that so that's what this team is about basically me and my wife um seeing as god has blessed ukraine with now eight churches and you know a couple thousand christians and it's wow. on a critical path to raise up new elders raise up new evangelists um but the other eastern european countries um haven't had that so we want to devote our lives in this next chapter can we recreate what Kiev and St. Petersburg and Moscow had? Can we recreate it in these other countries, these countries that never really had that? Okay. Um, and so we've ap appealed to the, to the people who have graduated college, and we appeal to the retirees. Um, because in my book, Matthew 28, isn't just talking to people who just graduated college. Right. Um, could we get some retirees to come? Could we get some one-year challenge people to come? put together a team and build such tight relationships before we land that everyone can see the love for one another. Right. And we land and for 10 months, we just share our faith every single day and beg God to bring open hearts and God willing, we'll see a hundred baptisms, 50 baptisms. I don't know, whatever God gives. Right. And then you've taken the church from 90 to 190 in one year. Right. And now you have half the church who's never seen a church not having consistent radical growth they, right. they don't they don't understand what the other you know the other parts experienced and i think then you get the critical mass and you start to change the genetic code of the mm -hmm. faith of the church hmm. so that's kind of the dream and the vision um that's a that's a great plan so what you're doing is you're you're forming a team and getting they're, I, I'm assuming they're going to come to Kiev first. You're working with them like a small D group. That's like your your pre pre mission period. And then wh where's your first target? So actually, we're gonna actually we've started. We do Saturday Zoom calls. Okay. Saturday kind of staff meetings. We got 28 people who've signed up on the team. Wow. Um, they're all raising their own funds to come. Um, we've raised. We need basically two hundred and forty thousand dollars to launch the entire team. Basically, we're asking people to live, you know, raise raise a thousand dollars for each month. So you come for ten months. The goal is to raise ten thousand dollars. So basically, two thousand dollars is the two plane tickets back and forth. So you have eight hundred dollars a month to live on um, while you're in Budapest, and uh, devote ten months. Don't look for a job. Preach the word. Um, me and Lena will train them. We'll walk with them. Um, and let's just pray for God to do something amazing. Now that's and, uh, so the goal is to raise two, two, I think the total is like 230,000 for the whole team. They've already raised 190, um, of that amount. So we're almost there. That's exciting. Um, so we come together every Saturday and actually we've been studying your book. <laughs> so the team is totally fired up about, um, having the right motivation, staying focused, being single-minded. I mean, some of the great things you taught in your book, outstanding. Um, but we're basically training um, on a weekly basis. And the dream is that we land in August 15th in Budapest. And we're going to be there for 10 months. And um, we're just praying to save 
tons of souls. That's exciting. So you're going to go with a team of 28. And how many disciples are there now? There's 90 in Budapest right now? Right. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And so you're going to go there for 10 months. And then what's the plan there? What's stage two? So <clears throat> you, you leave the is, church, you've got 190. That's the goal. Um, right. What do you do? So um, usually when people go on mission teams like this, one third will, maybe 10% won't even stay the entire time because okay. it's not for everybody. It right. sounds like fun, but right. it's not for right. everybody. A third of them will say, will say that was great, but I'm, I'm ready to go home. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think there'll be a third that'll say, you couldn't drag me out of here <laughs> if you wanted to. Right. Um, and I'm hoping some people will buy the farm like me and Lena did. Right. And so the, the dream is that God will raise up some people on this team who will catch the dream and then they can come with me and Lena to the next country. Okay. And we can eventually start to place, um, interns or church leaders or go to new countries we have six countries with no church at all hmm. so even as we think about getting to all the countries today i think mike tolliver on kidogo is starting a country countdown mm -hmm. a third of all the countries that we don't have a church in are all in eastern europe hmm. um so we we just need the resources we need some and i think this is if you think kingdom wide um what are the two resources that i think we really need to capitalize on it's and I, and I think the Mormons do this well. They send their young people over for a year or two right. to really adopt the mission in their hearts. Yep. And some will stay and praise God, but that's not going to be the majority. But then the ones that go home, they become an advocate for special missions. They view their neighborhood as a mission field. Mm -hmm. They have a reference point mm -hmm. for the mission. Mm -hmm. We have too many people graduating college that are just trying to get into their careers and figure out how to set up their 401ks. Right. You know, in right, their 30s, right. that's no, take a year, give back to God. That's Jesus, right. Jesus, come on, let's. And then I think if we had every campus kid somehow thinking, I'm going to spend a year or two to strengthen the needy areas, and some of these could be in the States too. I don't think every, you know, let's let's target the, the hundred churches who most need help in each two years, send people out, right? You, you, you have a thousand grads in the United States. Um, let's divvy them up and send them out to the hundred most needy churches. Take your hundred, take a thousand retirees. You have, there's so much depth in the churches in America. Oh I mean, my gosh. Isn't that the truth? You, you speak with a family group leader in Boston or Chicago, who's got 40 years of experience. Their kids are Christians. They've led family groups. They baptized, they counseled. These guys have more training than some of our, you know, some of our full-time ministers over right, here. Right. And if they could take a year and, and you can come over to Eastern Europe and live on a 10th of what it costs you to live in America. Mm -hmm. um, come spend a year, uh, live off your retirement and right. help us out. Cause we're first generation Christianity over here. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there were no Christians when we were growing up in this part of the world. Mm. Um, there's no reference point. So it's a clean slate, um, but we just don't have the examples. We don't have the... So that's kind of the dream with this. So for the next 10 years, we'd like to pick five or six countries. And then I think find other people like us, um, like the Skinners or the, or the Petruzzi's or, or people who can come over and take two or three countries and inspire a team to come with them and land for a year and help rebuild, strengthen a foundation that then can evangelize that country for the next 10, 20 years. That's exciting. Um, I'm, I'm so getting excited. Kind of I'm getting excited when you're talking about this. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that sounds fantastic. I, I'm going to have to keep this uh, secret from my wife. She's going to want to start packing her bags right now. That <laughs> I think it's a fantastic idea, Sean. Now here's a couple things I want to ask about Hungary. Um, from you know my my time overseas, I've I understand it has the hardest language in the world to learn. Right. Well, I, <laughs> I don't want to get too deep into it. what's your game plan to help people with language acquisition in Hungary. I heard it's just totally unique language. They don't even know the origins of it, and it's super tough. Right. No, that's true. Basically, you know, the team's just coming for ten months, so the goal is not to learn the language. 
Okay, so you, I, you don't, I, you're coming there and you, you feel, like, let's say a person is going, I'd like to go. That sounds so cool. I want to go. Maybe they're retirees or, but they're going, I'm not that great at languages. What would you tell them? Right. I would say come. I think that pretty much describes our whole team. And me and Lena won't pick up the language the, the time we're there. You know, the way we did it when we landed in Kiev or Russia, um, you know, we were given the charge even before we came to start praying for our Aaron the person who could speak to the people for us. Mm -hmm. So I was praying before I landed, God, give me my translator. Mm -hmm. Help me to find the guy who can get baptized and then follow me around and study the Bible with everyone. And until you find that person, you really can't do the mission. So I literally was walking up and down the street every day by myself in St. Petersburg until I met my translator. <laughs> um, and, and once I met him, you know, and it was incredible. I don't know if we have time, but it was incredible. I gave up. I was inviting 100 people a day and didn't find anyone who spoke English. And um, so there was no one to study the Bible with. And um, so I prayed specifically. I said, okay, God, let this guy be blonde haired, about five foot ten, and have on a red shirt. And that's going to be my translator. Because I know you want to give me this guy. I just must not be recognizing him. So that day, I didn't invite anyone. I was just walking up and down the street looking for the guy in the red shirt. And I found him. So I stopped him and I said, hey, I want to invite you to church. And he turned around. He had an English English Bible in his hand. <laughs> that's and amazing. I said, I said, do you speak do you speak English? And he said, yeah. And I said, I said, that's a Bible. And he said, yeah. And I said, would you like to study the Bible? He said, sure. And I said, how about now? And he said, OK. I was like, you, you know, you've got to be kidding me. Oh, <laughs> my God. So we, we walked over to the park and started to study the Bible. He was baptized six days later. And then and then he was the one who was with me when we studied the Bible with like the 60 men who got baptized in the next five or six months. So but he he you know, and then now he's leading Hope Worldwide in Moscow. So wow. he's uh, he's. But anyways, it was interesting. I met him, you know, when I later asked him, what were you doing with an English Bible in your hand? And he said. He had walked into a group like 200 meters before me that was passing out Bibles. And when they passed him out a Bible, they were Americans. They passed him out a Bible. He said, hey, could you study this with me? Wow. And the guy said, well, no, because we're just here for two weeks over the summer to pass out Bibles. We don't do that. Oh, gosh. And he walked away so discouraged. And he said he was just walking discouraged with this Bible, that he has this Bible, but no one to study it with. And literally two minutes later, I stopped him and I said, do you want to study the Bible? Wow. And it, was, it was very funny because he asked me, how long are you staying? And I said, I'm staying for good. Hmm. And he said, oh, no, no, you didn't understand what I asked you. I said, how long are you staying? And I said, well, I'm staying for good. And he thought I just didn't understand his Russian or something because right. no one stays. Right. The Americans come for the summer right. for a month right. and then they go home. Hmm. Nobody stays, not in the winter. Right. Oh, and man. he was so blown away, studied the Bible, became a Christian and but that's the goal. Um, everyone who's coming to Hungary, we're going to pray that we find our translator, our Aaron, in that right. first month. They become Christians, and then they help us to convert right. other people. It reminds me of that story where, where Jesus is sending out his disciples on the limited commission, and he says, find a person of peace or find the worthy person mm -hmm. and stay, right. with, stay with that person. So basically, right. you found that person with the red shirt, 5'10", right. blonde hair. What a, what a story. Um, and so... Okay, so if a person's listening and, and they're thinking, man, that sounds awesome. I'd love to go to Europe. I'd love to go on a mission team. So what you're saying is really all they need is a year of their time, $10,000, support themselves, and just a desire to, to share their faith. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. That's awesome. And so how, where would they contact you? Can they just, I guess I can just leave that in the, the notes for this podcast, but if they wanted to re reach you before then, what? Where would they contact you? Totally, yeah. On Facebook, Sean Wooten or Sean's Borsch. And, uh, you know, the team to launch this August is kind of solidified. And some of those guys on the team, they have GoFundMe. They're still trying to raise the money. They haven't quite hit the amount they need. So we're all really praying and fasting to finish the fundraiser. Um, but then, of course, with the virus, borders aren't open right now. Um, we can't get into Hungary right now. So we've basically set up four flags that are all red and those red flags have to turn green before the team can launch. So we're really praying um, for that to happen. Um, but we'll, you know, at some point we'll put out an advertisement, whatever, like, Hey, come join the revive team 2021 or 2022 mm -hmm. for Athens, Greece or 
Zagreb or Bucharest or Warsaw or Istanbul. And we'll just put it out there and people can sign up and say, I want to go. And um, they just need to raise some money to support themselves for that year. And then if their dream is to go into the ministry, we, we have uh, six of the positions on our team are actually campus ministers. They're actually kind of supported by the mission team because mm-hmm. the dream is that they would become the next church leaders um, or come with us to the next country. So there's opportunities to stay in Eastern Europe forever. There's countries that need to be led. There's cities that need to be planted. Um, there's lots to do. So if you have an ambition to be in the full-time ministry and to lead a church, um, come by the farm. Right. Um, but it, the great thing is, is that you have a year to test it. Um, right. You so go, you give a year, and then so you see. So there's no shame if a person just says, hey, I just want to wanna go and give a year and then come back. That's going to be fine, too. Right. That's actually all we expect from anybody. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, yeah. Okay. And then it's, you know, it's, it's the memories and it's the stories that will last you the rest of your life from that from that 10 month adventure. It'll be unbelievable. Yeah. It's, it's really inspiring because I know I've been talking, I've been talking to Glenn Petruzzi and he came up with a proposal that, that shares a lot of the same features of this plan. It's, it's just like synchronicity, how you, you Mm. thought this plan up, Glenn thought this plan up right around the same Mm. time. It it must be the Mm. spirit who is stirring things up. It's very, very Mm. exciting to me. And I, I just think it's fantastic. Now, at the 2016 Reach Conference, I mentioned this earlier, you preached to the general audience. You had lots of slides about growing our family of churches from around 100,000 disciples to a million disciples. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, this has got to be part of your plan. You know, how can we do that? Like that, this is so interesting to me. How can we break the log jam and start growing exponentially? What What are your thoughts? Mm-hmm. What if you were the king of the world, what would you do? <laughs> I'd recommend everyone read the book Zero to One Hundred. <laughs> Sorry, bro. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Oh, thank you. Um, so I think you know. I think, um, boy, it's challenging, right? Um, there's lots of thoughts um, at very at many different levels. Um, I think is a movement if we utilize the if if you utilize utilize the 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 retired people you utilize the 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 young professionals in the campus if everyone's devoted to evangelizing the world right I mean when I became a Christian churches were being planted and dreams were happening and I was like Wall Street who cares about Wall Street right. we're changing the world exactly um, and I think if we can re elevate that to become not just a slogan that everyone's memorized, but they see everyone engaging at that level. Um, I'm so proud of these guys on the Revive team. They're quitting jobs. Um, In a time like this, you don't quit your job. They're quitting jobs. I have retired people who are just planning on spending down their savings and their retirement Mm -hmm. to come to help change a country for eternity. Yes. Um, and to get the significance of what we're doing back up to where it's supposed to be, right. where, where God meant it to be. Right. Um, and then I think once you get in an environment, I'm sure my evangelism is going to grow exponentially when I land in Budapest right. because I'm with a team that that's just what we do. Right. Um, I can be so busy today and do great things for God right. and, and not share my faith. Right. And I can go to bed feeling like I spent my whole, I gave it all today for the kingdom, right. but I still didn't share my faith. And we want to develop the churches and mature them. So there's so many things you can do that don't really have to do with saving a lost world. Right. And I think that's the challenge we all face because not all of us are naturally comfortable doing that. There's some people who are very good at that just all by themselves. Some of us have to carry our cross uh, to be good at that. But whether we're carrying our cross or whether it's a natural gift, we all have to engage that. Right. And um, so I think creating those these places where we can reinvigorate, and I've even thought of doing the Revive program inside the Kiev church or inside the Odessa church. It doesn't have to be in a different country right? where you where you focus in the energy. And um, and then I think the, the comments you've made about the large church needs to become small. Mm. I think that's huge. Um, where it's not just staff run church. It's, 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 it's maybe someone's training the people, but we're working with the people around us 
I've seen John McGurk do a great job with that. Joe Salippo, great job. Mm -hmm. Andy Fleming in Birmingham, mm -hmm. where you land in the church with no staff. It's what you've been doing as well. And you're really building up the leaders. Everyone owns the church. It's not just the staff is busy doing everything. And that's right. the challenge when you, your church becomes big. Right. Um, all your best friends are on staff. Everything's divide, decided on staff. And you, you, not everyone's people are watching the triathlon, but they're not running it. Right. And um, so, you know, I think that's some of the challenges to bring Christianity back to every every household. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think I agree with you. I think that, you know, we have some amazing large churches that are just so um, filled with experienced people, lots of resources, but it takes a lot to maintain a church of a thousand or three thousand. I mean, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of attention. You need a lot of young people. And one thing that I that I see is um, those people those large churches are able to hire younger people, but they don't get the opportunity to, to maybe go out and plant a church like, like you mm -hmm. did, like I did, like I had the opportunity to do. Um, and I think that's a, a lost opportunity because I think mm -hmm. that if you're leading a, a, a ministry in a large church, that's, that's a certain experience, but mm -hmm. there's nothing that, can replace the opportunity to go out and plant a church where there's really nothing there. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is training that cannot be replaced. That is something mm -hmm. that um, you just, you can't experience in a larger church, the, the desperation, right. the fear, the insecurity, the, the testing, the challenge, the, you know, like, Oh Lord, if you don't come through here, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. That kind of, where it all depends on you, and yet it, it, it's got to depend on God. And I think that experience is something that we're going to need to bring back into the kingdom. Mm. And mm. Uh, the what you're talking about, the singular focus of, mm. of sharing your faith and just having a clear passion and mission, uh, mm. it's 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 hard to get that in a larger church. You know, I know what mm. it's like. And my church is not even that big, but it's like you get busy with with maintenance. Right, and there's right. Pa there's pastoring issues. There's there's counseling issues that that can take up all your time. I totally agree with you. So, I don't want to get off right. that. But I I think what you're doing there is is something that I'm going to be watching super closely. I think that mm. it's it's what we need. You're going to be watching super closely from Budapest, Hungary, because you're coming <laughs> over to spend time with us, bro. I can't wait. I can't wait. As I think we can get these airplanes flying again. Yes. But I think I think you're right. I think we need to have a church planting mentality mm -hmm. of even neighborhoods, right? Right. You get two families in a neighborhood and then you inspire them. Let's plant the church in this neighborhood. Well, I totally agree with you. And I, it's something I've been thinking very strongly about, even in the church here in Tucson, Arizona. It's like uh, we can't meet at our normal large church location, but I'm thinking, okay, how can, what what is God trying to do here? Maybe this is the time when we need to start meeting by, so, you know, uh, smaller towns, you know, in the metropolis, you know, the, mm -hmm. cause there's, you know, Tucson has a bunch of smaller towns that surround it that form, form its mm -hmm. perimeter. I think maybe this is the time when we've got leaders that are leading groups of 30 or 40 and, and they take on a much larger role, mm -hmm. whether it's preaching or teaching. And, and I go, I get, to me, I get excited about that. Cause I go, that's when we're going to start really multiplying. Mm, totally. You know, we had an interesting situation. <clears throat> It was, we had, we, me and Linda had landed in the summer. The church was like 150 and by, by New Year's, it was 512. And we had saw, we had, I checked kind of the world stats that there had never been a church over 500 that had doubled in one year. So we set the goal to double. We prayed and the staff fasted that we we're going to be 1,024 by the end of the year. And then interesting enough, uh, mid January, the police came into our service and kicked us out and canceled our registration and told us we could no longer meet together as a church. So we're, we're a church of 500 with baby Christians <laughs> and we can no longer meet in groups of more than 10. So what we did is we took all the money, we were renting halls and we went out and rented like 16 apartments spread out all over the city. And these apartments were empty, but they became churches and we <laughs> let singles and campus people live there and maintain the apartments. But that's where church was now. Wow. So we appointed, we appointed, basically 30 church leaders overnight. 
And we started to train them every week on how to lead a church, how to do a Sunday sermon, how to do communion, how to do midweek, how to take a contribution. Um, they literally had to take responsibility for everything because literally overnight we lost any ability to gather the church. And I thought, this is a disaster. God, what are you doing? We just prayed to double the church. Now we lost our halls. Now we're not going to grow at all. This is going to be terrible. But what actually happened was the exact opposite. Mm. All of a sudden, we had 30 people in the church who felt complete ownership for everything. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they were getting trained in everything, mm. how to lead Bible studies, how to come. You know, we would still do the cost counting with the staff, um, but they were preaching. They were doing Bible talks. They were doing midweeks. Mm -hmm. They were. And it was unbelievable. Now, we had a couple of the house churches almost split that we had right. to do. But basically, my whole life became just training these church leaders. That's all I did. Right. Right. Um, and we were underground for seven months. Um, we couldn't meet in groups of more than 10. And after seven months, the church had grown from 500 to 800. Wow. While we were in house churches. Then we came out of house churches. And it was unbelievable because, first of all, there was so much joy to finally be back together again. Right. It's kind of my picture of when we get out of quarantine. Right. <laughs> like, everyone's so fired up to... And then all of a sudden, when I gathered the staff before the church service, when we were all together, I had 30 people looking at me that were used to leading church. Right. And I mean, oh my gosh, they 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 knew how to get their group together afterwards, talk about everything. I mean, they there was so much ownership and leadership in the church at that hour. It just projected. I mean, and we 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 you know God did it. We grew exactly to 1,024 by the end of that year. That's God amazing. doubled the church. But I, what I thought was a tragedy of us being forced into smaller groups of 10, it actually turned out to be the, the, the greatest blessing because we actually focused on raising up leaders instead of the ministers doing all the work. Oh. So it was awesome. That's powerful. And what year was that? That was 1994. Okay, so that's when you came. That you, How long had you been in town before you had the, the uh, police raid the church? Eight months. Eight months. Okay. So you had just taken over and had been there for eight months. See, that's that's very powerful. I think that's super instructive for our current situation with coronavirus because mm -hmm. it's affecting the whole world. And and I right. think, okay, what what can God do to accelerate the growth? And mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, I, I've been talking to Bruce Williams and different people and talking to different leaders and you know, the, the constant theme is you, you have to raise up, multiply the leaders. You've, you've mm -hmm. got to concentrate on discipleship. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think what you're sharing there is, is, is the key. I feel like we've got mm -hmm. to take advantage of the difficulty we're facing and, and view it, change it from the obstacle to the, the path, the tool that God is going to use to help us to grow if, if we'll mm -hmm. accept it and d not, not just hold our breath, but go, okay, if we go with this, God is going to make it grow. I, I think mm. you're right on target. Amen. Yeah, I think it's interesting. When we come out of this quarantine, the new world, I think, is going to be safe in groups of 10 to 20, mm -hmm. which I think is the perfect number to expand and for the kingdom to thrive. Yeah. And, um, you know, Bible talks of 10 to 20 people, they can grow, they can multiply. And I think we have to resist the temptation right now to do these big online services that everyone comes to. Right. Let's start massively training the ones who are going to be leading the groups of 10 or 20 when we come out of this. Right. Let's get them all up to speed and then actually get them to start to lead even online. So there's that closeness, that family, that, that expansion happening at a smaller group level. I think we try and compete with compete sometimes. I think in our minds with these mega churches. I just don't think it's the way. I don't think do it's it. the way at all. I I totally agree. And I I went to a small group meeting, had about ten people this last Sunday, and I came away so fired up because I thought this is it. I, it's led by a, a guys like thirty younger, and it's filled with a bunch of young people. And I just I came away going, this is ready to grow. They they mm. had a couple there that's studying the Bible. They they brought their own food. They're in the they're mm. living room. I thought, okay, it just felt like right at home. I thought this this is what we need to do throughout the entire church, just small mm. groups. And I had the intern um, that I'm training. He preached to the group, and I just watched him and evaluated. And I thought, 
this is it. This is the atmosphere, the vibe that needs to happen. You know, right. you know, it's fine to listen to a sermon, um, you know, but there's a disconnect. You can just sit there and, and be completely disconnected as opposed to this group, which was everyone was involved. Everyone's doing something. So right, right. I, I think you're, that's good stuff. Yeah. It's, it's great. I mean, I could just talk, to, I, I, I'm going to have to kind of wrap this up here. This is, I could talk to you so much longer about this. Well, um, then I need my turn to ask you all these questions. <laughs> back at you, bro. You know, I it, guess I have to start my own podcast. Oh my gosh. Happen. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, what, so this must be just getting you super excited. I probably don't even have to ask what's getting you, what's getting you excited these days. But um, what advice would you give to someone like yourself, Sean, man or woman who wants to live a life of mission, a life of adventure, totally sold out for God? What what advice would you give him to just kind of get started? Well, I would say they're definitely on the right track. God definitely created them for that desire. And they have gifts that they haven't even scratched the surface of. And God can do things in their life that um, even if we told them right now, they wouldn't believe it. Mm. And uh, so I think just the acknowledgement of saying, that's what I want. You're already headed down the right road for sure. Mm. Um, now you just need some like-minded thinkers, some people that can be your support because you will have resistance and you will have suffering and it'll get hard. And that's all part of God training you to be able to do what it is you really want to do um, resistance training. It, it's, 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 you're going to suffer. So you've got to have people around you who won't let you off the hook. Right. Who won't say, ah, you really don't have to do that. Or right. dude, why don't you just relax or, mm -hmm. you know, get some like-minded people and absolutely find someone to mentor and disciple you. I think discipling is huge. Yeah. I, I can't exist without having someone discipling me. Right. Um, I don't care how, some people have tried to tell me, dude, you're already 50. I mean, really, do you really need somebody to still? <laughs> Absolutely. You're right. Absolutely. Right. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> my, my character is not there. There's no way I can see my blind sides. Right. And right. the Spirit is teaching people all over the world. How can I not take time to learn from them? There's no way I know what I'm doing. And if I want to see a church of 100,000, really, do I think I'm, oh, you think I am who I need to be right. for a church? for us to see a hundred thousand disciples in right. a country. Right. No. Oh right. my gosh. I got miles to go. So let's get started. That's and, right. And enjoy it. Enjoy Quit. it. So many people are like, when, so when, when will I finally get to a point where people stop telling me what to do and I can just do what I want to do? Wrong road. <laughs> exactly. Wrong road. I'm not getting on that road. <laughs> exactly. That's great. Any, any final words, Sean, this has been a fantastic time together. Anything that you want to, well, I, I just appreciate, bro, this time because I feel like you've you've kind of uh, refreshed my spirit for sure. And, uh, you know, I just think uh, resources that you're providing um, and just really your story of uh, risking everything, your business and everything to go plant a church from your family. And now what you're doing in Arizona, it's just it's so inspiring. And um you know, I think imitation is, uh, it's something that the Bible talks about. Um, and I think if you're on this podcast and you really want to grow, imitate, imitate, mm -hmm. um, the faith of people who are out there, your, your, your ministers, your leaders. Um, but I just appreciate what you're doing for the kingdom. And, um, I, I do, and, and we're waiting for you to come be with us in Budapest. Can't wait. And to teach. It's yeah, be it'll be awesome. Yeah, but pray for us. We're it's it's a very hard time to figure out how to launch this thing yep. to not put people in danger. And mm -hmm. you know, when you want to bring a team of twenty eight who are going to share their faith all day, and social distancing is like you know people are avoiding each other. Right. Exactly. It's, it's, is this is this how do we launch this properly that it'll be effective, not just bold but effective? Right. Um, it's, it's a very tricky time and, and there's definitely some cloudiness or unclearness in my mind. So any, any prayers that your listeners can make and offer up for me, um, that God will give us clarity on how to do this. Um, 
I would be very thankful. Yeah, you got it. In fact, let me just say a little prayer for you right now. And um, awesome. I think it just feels feels right. Lord, I want to pray for the work that Sean is doing in mm. uh, Ukraine and Eastern Europe. And I pray that you'll lay a blessing on it. And I pray for those who are considering uh, joining that work or uh, imitating the work there, wherever they're at around the world. Pray that you'll bless it and um, give give everyone the courage to make decisions to seek first your kingdom. Bless Sean, bless Lena, bless their family and the church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Hey, Sean, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic Thanks, time. Thanks for listening. Here's how you can help support the program. First, let your friends know about the podcast. Secondly, read and review one of my books, either How to Plant and Grow a Church or Courage, How to Make This Life Count. You can find them on Amazon.com. Finally, support the program with a gift today. The link is in the show notes because my goal is to inspire you to make this life count, live a no regrets life, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Have a great day and make this life count.